Unlike the plot in the drama, the real cases in life are mostly crudely designed and full of loopholes. In the early years, many cases couldn't be solved, partly due to technical limitations and partly because of the lack of social connections between the killer and the victim, which made it impossible to lock in the suspect. However, the murderer's modus operandi in this case was very well established. The police didn't find any evidence, and it can even be said to be one of the most meticulous murder cases I have seen. On April 27, 2014, Lan Kunyu, a 36-year-old factory owner in Taiwan, disappeared. His family found that he didn't go to work and couldn't be reached, so they called the police. The police found that he returned to his girlfriend's apartment after working at 3 a.m. on the 27th. After parking his car in the parking lot, he walked into the elevator of the apartment building but disappeared after exiting the elevator. His girlfriend Huang Jingwen said that he didn't return to the apartment that day, which meant that he disappeared from the elevator to the door of their home. Did Lan encounter an accident as soon as he got off the elevator and his body was dragged to the stairwell for disposal? Or did he go downstairs and leave home alone? The police searched the entire apartment building and also searched the other 11 buildings in the same community. Lan's family also launched a large-scale search for him, but no results were found. Huang provided two pieces of information to the police. First, Lan had told her that he was going to meet a client at a hotel that night. Second, Lan had bipolar disorder, and she was worried that he might do something silly. At that time, the Elisa Lam case was still widely being discussed in Taiwan, and many media compared Lan's disappearance to the Elisa Lam case. Therefore, according to this line of thought, Lan was also likely to end his own life or have an accident, and the body might still be in some remote place, but just had not yet been found. The police carefully examined the roof water tank, but there was no trace of Lan's presence. Huang had been showing great grief, constantly claiming that Lan was her, the love of her life, and had been unable to eat or sleep since his disappearance. Even when the police were investigating the garage, she followed them all the way, looking worried and depressed. The police first inspected their apartment and found nothing unusual except that it was clean as a whistle. Huang said that she had cleaned up the home after her boyfriend disappeared because when she was anxious, she cleaned. Afterward, the police reviewed the surveillance footage of the elevator in their apartment building after Lan's disappearance and found that on the second day after his disappearance, a woman wearing a jacket and helmet got in the elevator with large and small bags and took those bags to the garage. She did this five times. Due to the woman's garb, it was impossible to identify her. After the woman took the elevator to the garage for a while, Huang, who was wearing a white jacket, appeared in the elevator and went down to the garage too. Huang was originally highly suspected by the police. After watching this surveillance video, the police believed that the woman wearing a red helmet might be Huang. The woman took a total of 11 bags, walked out of the building, put them on a motorcycle, and rode away. The police tried to track her with surveillance to see where she took the bags, but due to incomplete surveillance coverage, the police could only see her out of downtown through surveillance, but didn't know where she went eventually. I think that you must have the same thought as the police. Did Huang dismember the body and was going to dump it? However, in the face of every question from the police, Huang could give reasonable explanations. The police asked her about what she did on the day after Lan's disappearance. She admitted that she had transported many bags out of her apartment. She explained that the stuff in the bags were all clothes and she had so many things in this apartment, so she moved some of those to her other house. She also took the police to her house to check. All the bags were indeed there. 
However, the police counted all the clothes there and found those were only about five or six bags of stuff. Huang explained like this, I have taken out all the clothes, so you couldn't tell how many stuff exactly there are. Then the police continued checking the elevator surveillance video. They zoomed in and zoomed in on the footage of Huang pressing the elevator button and found that she had band-aids on her finger, indicating that she had a wound. Huang said that she accidentally sliced into herself while cutting vegetables. Although the police suspected Huang was the murderer, there was no evidence to prove that she committed the crime. The police searched the apartment three times and conducted luminol reaction tests. We know that the luminol reagent is extremely sensitive, and even if someone dilutes and cleans the area contaminated with blood, a reaction can still be observed after spraying. However, there was not even a trace of blood reaction in the apartment where Huang and Lan lived. Without direct evidence, the police had no choice but to take Huang to the police station for questioning. After 24 hours of continuous interrogation, Huang finally confessed. She said, Lan is no longer alive. So in the end, it wasn't that the police found evidence or found the body, but Huang herself confessed which solved the case. Lan was 36 years old and ran a lathe factory with an annual income of about $400,000. He and Huang had been together for many years, and they lived together. Huang is 10 years older than Lan. She had been married twice and had a child. Two years before the murder, Lan invited Huang to invest $1 million, about $30,000, in his factory. He promised to give her a 200,000 Taiwan dollar dividend every year. However, at the end of the year, Lan didn't fulfill his promise and refused to pay the dividend. Huang was dissatisfied with this. Besides, Huang always thought that Lan would marry her. But when she became pregnant, Lan insisted that Huang have an abortion and said that his parents would not agree with him marrying her due to their age difference and other reasons. Since then, Huang had held a grudge against Lan and his parents and even decided to kill Lan's parents for revenge. After she killed Lan, she took a gasoline barrel to Lan's parents' home, planning to set fire to it, but finally gave up. The day before the murder, Huang went to the store to buy gasoline and a large plastic bucket. In order not to be recognized by the clerk, she bought them with cash wearing a motorcycle helmet. When Lan returned home at three o'clock that day, Huang made him a cup of strong black tea to cover the smell of ten sleeping pills inside. You may wonder where the sleeping pills come from. Huang lied to the doctor that she suffered from insomnia and repeatedly prescribed sleeping pills, which she then stored for later. After drinking the tea, Lan quickly lay on the bed and fell asleep. At this time, Huang took a kitchen knife and cut his neck to death with one stroke. In order to prevent blood splattering, she had spread plastic covering on the bed beforehand. After Lan died, Huang dragged him into the bathroom and placed his neck in the large plastic basin that she had bought beforehand to bleed. Three or four hours later, the blood was finally drained, and Huang moved Lan to the bathtub and began dismembering him with a cleaver. She divided the body into seven pieces and wrapped them in clothes. As for the eleven large bags that appeared in the elevator surveillance, four of them were actually clothes. Just in case the police might find her through the surveillance, she put body parts in the bags together with a lot of clothes. When she transported these eleven large bags, she changed three outfits in order not to be recognized by the police. After leaving the apartment, Huang first rode a motorcycle to a surveillance blind spot then loaded all the bags into a rented car and drove to dump the body. It is worth mentioning that no one around her knew that she could drive because she secretly got her driving license not telling anyone just for transporting the body. This shows that she had premeditated this murder for a long time, just as the sleeping pills she stored. She drove to a forest in the suburbs and poured gasoline on the body along with bloody bedsheets and clothes. She was afraid of being discovered and didn't stay at the scene for long, so she lit the fire and left. Then she drove to another area without surveillance and discarded the gasoline tank. The next day, she returned to the site of the incineration to check and found that Lan's hands and feet had been burned off, but his main body and head were not. 
so she dug a shallow pit nearby and buried the remaining body parts, carefully covering them with grass. If Huang never confessed, the police might not be able to find the body. Afterward, she went to her hotel to check in and hid the knives in the room. After handling everything, she prepared her answers and waited for the police to arrive. Huang's crime can be said to have been carefully planned, even down to the details. Sure enough, at first, the police really had no evidence to prove that she did it and had to seek a breakthrough through psychological tactics. Fortunately, her psychological defence was not strong enough and after being questioned by the police for 24 hours, she confessed. Huang said that she had planned the murder for two years. She had hatred towards Lan, but she was able to control her emotions during the two-year planning period, presenting herself as a loving girlfriend. When the police came, she was able to play the role of a grieving girlfriend. Lan may have taken advantage of Huang economically and emotionally, but he didn't expect Huang to demand repayment in this way. In the eyes of Huang's family, she was kind-hearted and the last person to commit a crime. In the end, Huang was sentenced to life imprisonment, 